Okay, so in the video today, this is gonna be a little bit different. As you can tell, the setting is obviously different. We're not behind the wheel. We're not even in the garage really talking about the build itself. Um, but this is an important topic that I've been wanting to uh, discuss for a little while now. There's a lot of people, including myself, uh, getting into boosted cars and in the quest for more power, that means you need more air and more fuel, i.e. a bigger turbocharger and larger fuel system. This video is primarily going to focus on the turbocharger itself and the different turbochargers that I've used and the boost curves that are associated with those. Now, a lot of variables changed between the graphs I'm about to show you for the four different turbochargers I ran. Um, it was a different time of year. It was, uh, some of them were on a stock motor. Uh, the final one is on a fully built motor. So that one takes into account a lot of other things. And I'll go over that a little bit more. Um, as I show you these graphs, you're going to have to bear with me. I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out how to do a quality screen record, um, and voice over these graphs, uh, and use the GoPro and kind of splice it all together. But, uh, I'm not going to spend hours trying to figure this out. So uh, what I'm going to do is a couple short uh, audio clips like this uh, with video, and then I will show you the graphs for a few seconds and you can kind of take a look at them. What I want you to pay attention to in this, in all these graphs is um, your um, x-axis is going to be your um, boost level and y is going to be... Um, the RPMs, all the graphs are the same in that manner. Um, and what we're really looking for here is we're looking at the, the spool time or spool interval over RPM. Are certain turbochargers, as we go up in size, are they a lot laggier? Do they come on later in the RPM range? And so we'll take a look at that. And in this first graph, this is the stock turbocharger. Uh, so I'm going to glance at this. Unfortunately, like I said, I had a really hard time trying to do voiceover and record my screen. It just, uh, I didn't like the way it turned out. So um, let's see here. This very first graph, I'm going to open it up. This, like I said, is the stock turbocharger. Um, and we've got, we're going to, we're going to look at two points. I'm going to look at 10 PSI and peak pressure. Uh, so in this particular one, you'll see that uh, we hit 10 PSI right around 3000 RPMs. This is a stock motor with a stock turbocharger. It's got like a Cobb SF intake and a cat back exhaust and a custom tune. That's it. There's nothing fancy going on here. Uh, so we hit 10 pounds right around 3000 RPMs. We hit our peak of 19 pounds. It uh, looks like right around 41, 42, or 4,200 RPMs. And uh, I let off in this pole right around 6,700. So again, at 10 PSI, you're about 3,100. And at 18 PSI, you're at about 41, 4,200 RPMs. So I'll show you that uh, graph right now. Okay, and then in this next graph, this is the FP Green. This is still the stock Type RA motor, but I'm running uh, a single Walboro 450 pump, stock fuel lines up to the engine bay, and then a Dash 6 uh, fuel line system from the fuel pressure regulator out to the rails. Running an ID 1700 fuel injector and E85. And the, of course, the first graph, um, since it was pretty much a stock setup, that is on pump gas. Um, I'm not really showing any of the dyno graphs in this one, but I will tell you the power it made if I know what it was. The stock car, I think it was making like 310 at the wheels, uh, maybe. I, I really don't remember on that one. So this next graph is the FP Green. And with this one, we came on, we're making 10 pounds right around 3,300 RPMs, actually. It's coming in uh, really early with that uh, ethanol and injectors and everything else that we did there. Um, uh, we also switched to a front mount intercooler. It's got, you know, 
different intake pipe, the whole bunch of variables changed in this one. So this is where it starts to get interesting. Um, like I said, you're getting 10 pounds right around the 30, actually that's about 3,300 RPMs. You're getting peak boost of 32 pounds right around 4,500 RPM. So still coming in nice and early, um, but you're not, I'm not able to rev this out very far. It starts falling off before 5,000 RPMs. The boost starts dropping down. And by red line, we're close to 25 uh, PSI at 6,200 RPMs. Looks like I let out pretty early on this pull. Um, but again, that's, that's a really... Uh, nice graph and it shows you that the spool is comparable with the stock turbocharger yet we're moving a lot more air um, at 32 psi this fp green was making 550 wheel horsepower it was really fun it was very responsive on the street um, but after this i wanted to go to a rotated setup i had a 6870 and a precision 6262 one was the 6262 is a ball bearing turbo and the 6870 is obviously a ball bearing and you'll see the difference in the boost there. But this next slide that'll be on for 10 seconds is the FP green boost graph. So hope you enjoy this. Okay, then the next turbocharger, like I said, is the Precision 6262 journal bearing turbo. Again, this is on a stock motor. Looks like we're making 10 pounds right at the 4,000 mark. But again, this is a, another journal bearing, just like the FP Green. Um, so it is definitely coming in a little bit later here to hit the 10 pound mark. But you also have to keep in mind that the volume of air, the CFM of air, at that same boost level is significantly greater as the turbocharger size goes up. So the amount of power you're going to get at the same boost level is can be quite a bit different. Um, and then you've got uh, peak boost on this guy. I think we were hitting a about 36 PSI with this, and it was making 670 horsepower on ethanol. And we hit our peak, looks like right about 52, 5300 RPMs. And I'm gonna show that graph to you guys right now. Another thing to keep in mind with these graphs is there's no smoothing. This is straight from the data log and I just um, graphed it in Excel. I did zero smoothing. Um, so on this next one, this is again on the stock motor, stock intake manifold, but we are running the Precision 6870 turbocharger. Uh, this is on the same ETS rotated kit as the Precision 6262 journal bearing. Uh, ETS front mount intercooler. We did step the fuel system up to dual um, Walboro 525s with this, dash eight feed lines from the pumps to the engine bay and the fuel pressure regulator. And we also upped the injector size to ID 2600s here. So there were some changes that took place, but it, again, it is still a stock motor. This is the one that we broke the rod and piston in, sent the rod right out of the top of the block. Uh, you've seen that in some other videos that I did. Um, so back to the graphs here and talking about turbo lag. So you had the 6262 coming in on the stock motor right around 4,000 for 10 PSI. This is all the way up at 4,500 RPM to hit 10 PSI. But the 6870 is moving significantly more air than the 6262. Um, I think it's about 110 pounds a minute is the volume of air on that. Um, so the power curve is, is definitely up there. I wish I had all the dyno graphs to show you guys with this, but I'm not going to try and hunt them up all right now. You can see them on my Instagram, which is Valerie, the STI, uh, underscore between the words. We've got our peak boost with this way out here because we're trying to keep the torque down and not blow a rod out of the block like we ended up doing once we switched to the Process West intake. Um, 
but we're hitting 40 pounds here at 6,400 RPMs. We're letting out right around 7,000. Um, all these poles were done on, well, some of these were on the street, some of these were on the dyno uh, and virtually dynoed, but we're really only interested in the boost curve here. So none of that matters. Um, so again, 4,500 PSI or wow, 4,500 RPM for 10 PSI and 6,400 for our peak of 40 PSI. All right, the, on to the final graph. This is where things get really interesting. This is the built motor. So it's still a 2.5 liter. It has the same stroke. It does have a plus two millimeter rod and piston, um, but those are offset from each other. So the stroke remains the same. It's just a little bit smoother uh, running engine that way. This is the same exact precision 6870 that we had in the previous graph but with the built motor and the processed west intake, it does have a, st a stock throttle body here. Um, but with the built motor, we're able to try and do some things with the turbocharger that you wouldn't really do on a stock motor that's not built for this. Um, we're doing some quick spool, forcing the wastegate closed, trying to get this to spool up a little bit earlier. And we also have significantly reduced any airflow restrictions that we had in the intake system by uh, running the process west intake. We've got big uh, camshafts in here, uh, running BC280 cams, ported heads, oversized valves. We've really done everything we can to minimize the airflow restrictions for even being outside the boost curve. So that's what's really cool about this built motor. It actually um, makes a it feels like a very peppy car, even outside of boost. In fact, when I'm cruising around, it's pretty fun, uh, even before I start breaking the boost threshold. But that boost threshold for 10 pounds is now happening. Um, it's all the way down here. It's at 3,900 RPMs. So again, it's about 1,000 RPMs less than your stock turbo, but it's a shit ton more air. Um, that 10 PSI is probably three to four times the volume of air as the stock turbocharger at the same pressure. And it's boost pressure that kills these motors. That's what's hard on them. It's not necessarily and torque, but it's the pressure that kind of gives you that, you know, safe threshold of lifting a head or blowing a head gasket out or bending a rod. It's not so much the volume of air at that given pressure, it is the pressure itself because that pressure is a boosted engine's compression. So the if I can get the same amount of air at 10 PSI with one turbocharger versus uh, 20 PSI for the same volume of air with a smaller turbocharger, and, I don't, and I'm not sacrificing my spool or my RPM or uh, basically the response and recovery of the turbocharger too much, the larger turbocharger definitely makes more sense in this scenario for, um, you know, just engine health, engine longevity, and power. Uh, so again, I'm going to show you this graph here in just a second. This is the built motor um, with all the airflow restrictions removed. 10 PSI coming on right around 3,900. We're making peak boost here at looks like about 5,500 RPMs. This thing hits 48 PSI and... The way my exhaust system is running a full out the back with mufflers, there's a lot of exhaust restriction in this car. So the boost actually starts to taper down here pretty hard after we hit peak, but it stays above 40 PSI. In fact, it stays right around 42 pounds. Um, this hit 903 horsepower and 730 foot pounds of torque out of this little 2.5 liter. Very impressive. Um, it's definitely fast enough to give you a good scare. And this is this is getting up there in that power level, even for a built motor. Um, not going to go into all the motor specs at this time. I've got another video on the motor that's in this car. We revved this out to 8,200. You'll see in the graph. And that's not the red line in this car. Um, I usually try and shift around eight until I get to fourth gear. And at that point, that's where... Uh, 
in fourth gear, if you don't want to shift at the track, obviously you're trying to get a good uh, ET. Uh, this this red line is set to uh, over 9,000 RPMs. I'll just I'll tell you that. So my experience, uh, you know what? I'll I'll sum it up after I show you this graph. So this is the built motor with the 6870. Check out where boost comes on and how it holds the peak. Again, it does taper out on the back end because of the exhaust restrictions, which I've got some ideas on um, how we can improve that here in the near future. So. Okay, so to sum all this up, I kind of talked about it throughout the video, trying to keep this short. I apologize for the back and forth and the no voiceover on the grass. That's my, uh, my technical laziness. I've never tried to do a screen record outside of like a Zoom meeting or a Teams call. So um, you'll have to bear with me. I'm not a vlogger, video editor, YouTube person. This is just a guy with a GoPro and a car that he likes to share. So um, you saw all the graphs. If you want to look at any of them again, they're in 10 second clips. You can go back and, and check those. If I can figure out how to mark them in YouTube with where they're at in the video, I will. If not, I apologize. Um, so to sum this up in my experience, when looking at turbochargers and upsizing to get more power, one of my biggest concerns was, well, I don't want to sacrifice drivability on the street. I don't want a lazy turbocharger. I don't want this thing to not spool up until it's at five or 6,000 RPMs. That just sounds like it's not going to be any fun. There's a lot of things that go into making power and making a car streetable other than just turbo size. Uh, tuning obviously plays a huge role in how the car is going to drive. In my experience with the four turbochargers that I ran and the different engine combinations here, um, I'm not disappointed in the streetability of the 6870 whatsoever. I'm glad that I stepped up to the 6870 and I'll probably even step up a little bit higher to a 7270, um, which will just bolt right up in my car and... Uh, I've seen the results of that compared to the 6870. It's making almost 100 wheel horsepower more all the way through the boost curves. So um, it's this car, like I said, it made 903 at 48 PSI. 36 PSI is my street map on ethanol, and that's making about 770. Um, the 72 millimeter turbo, the 7270, um, would would be laying down well into the 800s at that same boost level so and the curve is is very similar because the turbine housing is still a 70 millimeter so you're still spooling it up about the same uh, i wouldn't expect my boost curve to really shift very much to the right with that at all if i had stepped down into a 6466 let's say which i personally have not ran um, it might come on a little bit earlier but I think it would be very close to the 6870 uh, based on the others I ran, like the 6262. However, um, the recovery would be different between shifting gears. So it will drop down a little bit lower before picking back up. That will be apparent, but you're probably not even going to notice it that much uh, in your, your drivability. Um, Getting this thing up into 10 pounds is no big deal at all. Uh, you can get there, like I said, partial throttle, 4,000 RPMs. This thing's already at 10 pounds of boost, which with the size of this turbocharger, that's already starting to uh, really get the vehicle moving. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions uh, on my experience with turbochargers or you just have any general questions about my car or uh, your particular build and you want some advice or ask if I've, I've tried something and it worked or it didn't work. Uh, but I really like the big turbochargers in these cars. They, they, I think that they're built for this. They are phenomenal. They don't lose their street ability. This thing, even on a curvy road with such a big turbo, it's still incredibly fast. The turbo recovers good enough on the street to stay in boost and get into boost get across that, uh, you know, that boost threshold and, and start really making some, some power. So I appreciate you watching this video. Hopefully you learned a little bit. Um, 
I'm sorry the graphs were not, like I said, they're not super scientific. These are straight up data logs of boost with no smoothing in different uh, conditions. So summer and summer, summer and winter, they are all in the same area. They're all on a, on a flat road. So uh, there is that, this, this, the load shouldn't be changing uh, between these graphs at least. Anyways, I appreciate you watching and stay tuned for more.